Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this webinar being put on by Number Five Chambers regarding the conjoined appeals of Paul, Almer, and Purchase. Uh, apologies if anyone's joining halfway through this introduction, but we're going to get going now as we've, we've crossed over the half past 12 mark. Uh, my name's Oliver May, and I'm one of the four barristers from Number Five Chambers who will be appearing in this webinar today. Uh, alongside me, uh, you'll see we have Henry Pitchers, QC, David Tyack, QC, and Esther Gamble. Each of us appeared before the Court of Appeal in the conjoined appeals of the cases of Paul uh, and the Royal Wolverhampton NHS Trust, Palmere and Royal Cornwall Hospitals NHS Trust, and Purchase and Ahmed. Uh, Henry and I appeared on behalf of Mr. and Mrs. Palmere, and David and Esther appeared on behalf of Mrs. Purchase. Uh, judgment from the Court of Appeal was handed down on Thursday last week, which was the 13th of January 2022. Uh, in each of the appeals, the defendants were successful, uh, meaning that the appeals by the defendants in Paul and Palmere were allowed, and the appeal by purchase uh, was refused. And the claimants have been granted permission to appeal uh, to the Supreme Court. Now, the format of today's webinar is the following. Um, first, we'll have an overview of secondary victim claims and how they work uh, by Henry Pitchers QC. Uh, then uh, Esther Gamble will provide us with a summary of the facts of each case and, and their nuances. Uh, and then David Tyre QC will discuss the uh, Court of Appeals decision and the relevant arguments there. And then finally, uh, Esther will come back in to discuss what might happen in the Supreme Court and indeed the possible implications of it. Now, importantly for those watching, following that, there will be a, a question and answer session at the end. Now, hopefully you'll be able to see that there is a Q&A function within the Zoom call. Please do use that to ask any questions. I believe you can do so anonymously uh, if you would like to ask a question anonymously. Uh, if you aren't uh, content to use the Q&A function, you can also send me a question directly using the ordinary chat function. And again, if you ask a question, I will assume you want to be anonymous unless you expressly tell me otherwise. Uh, so without further ado, um, we'll go straight to Henry Pitchers QC for an overview of secondary victim claims. Thanks, Ollie. Um, so I'm conscious that some of you watching this webinar may not be that familiar with this area of the law. You may not have run many of these cases yourselves. So I'm going to try to give you a bit of background that will, will, will tee up a discussion of the appeals themselves. And I'm going to start by looking at some of, some of the basic definitions that arise here. And at the risk, the real risk, I think, of, of stating the obvious, secondary victims must be contrasted with primary victims. And crucially, secondary victims have suffered no direct physical injury uh, as a result of the defendant's negligence. So their injury will be psychiatric in nature. And it's secondary in nature in that that psychiatric injury will be a response to witnessing uh, a shocking event or its immediate aftermath involving a loved one of the secondary victim. So the secondary victim themselves isn't physically imperiled by the defendant's negligence. They just observe horrifying events involving uh, a loved one. And in this context, and you'll hear this uh, coming, if you read the decision, you'll also hear it in the course of this uh, presentation. When we talk of the primary victim, we're talking about the loved one uh, in this context. And you need to keep that distinction in mind. The, dis the distinction uh, isn't always obvious, um, particularly in the clinical negligence context. One can Im imagine a number of cases which involve a, a mother whose baby suffers, a pregnant mother, whose baby suffers cerebral palsy or is stillborn as a result of the negligence of the clinicians who were managing uh, her pregnancy or the delivery. And she's treated in law as a primary victim. She's treated as a single entity with, uh, with her baby prior to, prior to birth. Whereas the father, uh, who may be present at birth and may witness uh, some, some events which are horrifying to him, will have to satisfy the tests uh, which apply to secondary victims. Um, an important point to emphasise is that there will be 
uh, a large number of cases, and frankly, the vast majority of cases in personal injury and clinical negligence work, where there will only be primary victims. Um, there must be a primary victim for there to be a secondary victim claim, because otherwise there's nothing for the secondary victim to witness. However, and this is an important distinction, um, that primary victim need not actually to have been injured or harmed. So you can have a secondary victim with a successful claim and a primary victim who perhaps imperiled hasn't got their own cause of action. And the obvious example is, is the near miss where perhaps a parent looks out of their house and sees an out of control vehicle running towards uh, a group of children, including children of the parent, but in fact, those children aren't injured. I mean, it's not going to arise very often, but conceptually, it's important to know that there need not be actual harm suffered by uh, the primary victim. And I'm going to look at the, the two in this preliminary uh, introduction, to look at the two leading cases in the House of Lords decisions of McLaughlin and O'Brien uh, and Alcock and Chief Constable of South Yorkshire. And I think it, it is worth just pausing to look at the facts uh, of those cases. McLaughlin was a road traffic case, and the claimant was at home about two miles from the scene of the accident. Uh, and the, the accident involved her husband and three of her children who were, who were in the car. And she was told of the accident about an hour or so after it had occurred and she was taken to hospital. And when she arrived at hospital, uh, she saw her husband, his shirt was hanging off, he was covered in mud and oil, profoundly distressed, and told her that their daughter, one of their daughters had died. She saw her surviving daughter who, whose face was cut. She was again covered in dirt and oil, if you like, the, the after effects of the accident. And she could hear her son shouting and screaming and she, and she went to his side when he lost, at which point he lost consciousness. Uh, so her claim was successful. Um, so although she didn't witness the accident, the House of Lords was content that what she witnessed was within the immediate aftermath concept. So the immediate aftermath of the accident, she suffered a psychiatric injury, it was wholly reasonably foreseeable, and there were no policy reasons why, why her claim should not be successful. Alcock is the House of Lords decision, or one of the House of Lords decisions arising out of the Hillsborough disaster, which I'm sure you will be familiar with. Uh, and it involved claims brought by the friends and relatives of those killed uh, and injured. The defendant was the chief constable who was responsible for the policing uh, of the event. Now the claimants varied. Some were in, in the stadium um, and not in the, the middle of the disaster, but able to witness from their, their vantage point what was happening in the Leppings Lane end. Some saw live TV footage, aware that their loved ones were present. Others were told of the events by third parties and some later saw some recorded TV images. And the claimants argued in the House of Lords, or the plaintiffs, uh, that uh, all that was required was reasonable foreseeability. Um, and they were unsuccessful. And from these two decisions, we're able to distill and discern the particular requirements that arise in secondary victim claims. Th these have become known as the the control mechanisms. I'm going to set those out for you. But before we do, let, let's remind ourselves that what we're, what we're looking at here is what are the criteria that will lead a court to conclude that a duty of care is owed to the secondary victim? And these are criteria in addition to the normal requirement for reasonable foreseeability uh, of injury. So the, the first of the control mechanisms uh, is that there is a close tie of love and affection. So this is a close tie of love and affection between the secondary uh, and the primary victim. And here the court is focusing upon the, the class of claimants who are potentially able to bring a secondary victim claim. And if one pauses here, we often hear arguments about floodgates uh, in, in these sorts of cases. And that limitation of the class of claimants to those who have a close tie of love and affection, I would suggest is it operates significantly to limit the number of claimants potentially. And it's a, it's a very good answer to to a floodgates argument. It will be decided on a case-by-case -case basis. There are some obvious examples, the parent-child relationship, the spousal relationship, where it will be pretty much will be assumed that such close tie exists. 
worth highlighting that in Alcock, claims were unsuccessful on this basis by a brother, a brother-in-law and an uncle on the basis that there wasn't evidence before the court upon which it could be concluded that there was a sufficiently close tie of love and affection. So in theory, you may need to prove it. So you may have a less obvious relationship. You may need to lead evidence to confirm that there's a close, in fact, a close tie of love and affection. I suppose not all, so not all siblings have that feeling towards each other. The second control mechanism is that the claimant must be proximate in both space and time to the event or its immediate aftermath. So this is proximity. Uh, now this could be in the, in, the, in the accident paradigm, witnessing the, the accident itself, actually seeing it take place. Or it may be within the immediate aftermath doctrine, such as the facts of McLaughlin, coming, on, coming to the scene of the accident very shortly afterwards, or seeing the injured loved ones very shortly after the accident has occurred. So as I say, it's proximity, both physically, so in, in space and temporally uh, in time. The injury has to arise from a sudden and unexpected shock to the claimant's nervous system, which is a slightly old fashioned way that it's put in the House of Laws decision. And what this reflects is you, you can't have a gradual accumulation of psychiatric injury over a period of extended time, a slow appreciation, slow dawning of, of horror then it needs to be a sudden uh, and unexpected shock, a sudden appreciation of a horrifying event. And, th and th this echoes throughout the, the appellate decisions that we see. Uh, and finally, as we distill these things, the, the shock must be caused by witnessing the event directly through sight or hearing. So it's not good enough just to be told of some horrifying news. As per Alcock, it's not sufficient to watch it on television, even if even if you're watching it live, uh, there needs to be that direct witnessing of, of, of the event or its uh, immediate aftermath. Now, there have been, as you'd expect, subsequent decisions that have considered the application of the control mechanisms, a number at first instance, uh, a few at Court of Appeal level prior to Paul, Paul Mirren purchase. I'm not going to go through all of those. What I am going to do is just to introduce two of the most, probably the most important decisions that relate to the matters that were before the Court of Appeal at the hearing in December. And, and uh, Dave will pick up on these cases and explore their ratio, did, did a difficult bit, frankly, uh, in relation to these. The, the first one I want to talk about is Walters. So this is North Glamorgan NHS Trust and Walters. This is a clinical negligence case. Uh, and it involved a seriously ill baby uh, and the claim by the baby's mother for the psychiatric injury she suffered as a result of what she witnessed. And to simplify matters, um, the negligence there was that the, the hospital clinicians failed to make the right diagnosis and therefore failed to, to start the right management plan. And after that negligence, a couple of weeks passed, some of which the baby spent at home, but during which the baby remained ill. And uh, the baby was taken back to hospital, very ill, um, and then four days later, so four days after the return to hospital, um, when the baby's mother was present in the hospital room, the baby suffered a seizure and it, it sparked, uh, unfortunately, the last 36 hours of that baby's life. And the argument, it's fair to say, in the Court of Appeal was primarily focused upon whether that 36 hours from seizure to death could qualify as an event for the purpose of a secondary injury claim. And the Court of Appeal agreed that it could. So this claim was a successful one. Uh, this clinical negligence secondary victim claim was successful. What's, I think, worth highlighting is that it's clear from the, the facts as, that, as reported that there was a delay of two or three weeks between the negligence and the beginning of that event, the beginning of those 36 hours. And that didn't operate to, to prevent the claimants from succeeding. The second case, and probably given the, the, the rationale of um, the, the Court of Appeal in the recent decision, the most recent decision, the most important one is Taylor and Novo. Now, this is a personal injury claim. Uh, and uh, the, the claimant there was the daughter of the primary victim. The primary victim was involved in an accident at work. And that accident at work involved some racking boards collapsing uh, onto her, which caused... Uh, what I think 
would have seemed to have been relatively minor injuries at first, but it included a blow to the head, I think a leg injury as well. Um, now the claimant, the daughter, the secondary victim wasn't present uh, for that accident at work. But three weeks later, um, the primary victim uh, collapsed and died at home and it, and it transpired that she'd sustained and developed a deep vein thrombosis uh, and then subsequently pulmonary emboli that had caused a collapse and death. And this collapse was witnessed by the daughter and it caused her to suffer post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, but for reasons that will be uh, expanded upon by, by Dave in due course, the Court of Appeal determined that that claim should fail. The claimant hadn't witnessed the earlier accident at work, rather had only witnessed uh, the later consequence at home some three weeks later, and the Court of Appeal concluded that in those circumstances there could be no successful secondary victim claim. Thank you very much for that, Henry. Um, Esther, can we come to you now, please? Could you please uh, give us a, a summary of the three cases that were the subject of, of these appeals? Thanks, Ollie. Um, so I'll start with the case of Paul, uh, and then I'll talk about the case of Purchase and then the case of Holmere. Um, so in the case of Paul, Mr. Paul had been to the defendant's hospital with symptoms of heart disease, uh, and he had risk factors for heart disease as well. And it's alleged that further investigations should have been carried out, a coronary angiogram, and that that would have shown a serious heart problem, significant coronary artery disease, which would have been successfully treated with surgery, with a coronary revascularization. Uh, but instead, those further investigations weren't carried out, the diagnosis wasn't made, no treatment was given, and he carried on with life. And about uh, 14 months later, when he was out shopping with his two young daughters, he suffered a heart attack in front of them and couldn't be revived. Um, it was clearly a horrific experience for his children to go through and both of them developed psychiatric injury. After proceedings were served for their secondary victim claims, the defendant applied for strikeout or summary judgment on the basis that the lapse of time, that 14 odd months, between the alleged breach of duty and Mr Paul's collapse meant that in light of the decision in Taylor and Novo, which Henry's just been talking about, the claims couldn't satisfy the control mechanisms. That application came before Master Cook in late 2019. He agreed with the defendant and he struck the claims out. The claimant appealed and in June of 2020, Mr. Justice Chamberlain uh, allowed the appeal, reinstated the claims uh, and gave a, a really detailed and interesting judgment, which dealt with a lot of the issues that we're talking to you about today. Uh, and it's certainly worth a read if you're interested in delving into the issues in even more detail than we have time for today. Um, after his decision, the defendant sought and was granted permission to appeal to the Court of Appeal. In my and Dave's case, the case of purchase, our client, Mrs. Purchase's 20-year-old daughter, Evelyn, had been a bit off colour for a few months. And then over the course of a few days, she stopped eating properly and she was getting increasingly unwell. And it was obviously worrying for her parents. So our client took her to see an out-of-hours GP, the defendant. And it's uh, our client's case that he missed signs of pneumonia and should have advised them to go to the hospital or told them that it could be pneumonia and that if it got any worse, they should urgently go to the hospital. But instead, he said that she seemed depressed. He prescribed antidepressants and some other medication and uh, he sent them home. Evelyn remained unwell. And a couple of days later, she started to suffer with heart palpitations. That was her mum's birthday. And they'd had long-standing plans for a girls' night out with Evelyn's younger sister. Evelyn insisted that they go and have a fun night out. And none of them had any reason to think that her condition could be life-threatening. So they went out. In the early hours of the morning, uh, Evelyn's mum came home and she walked into her bedroom to go to sleep. And she found Evelyn apparently lifeless on her bed, still warm. She became hysterical, as anyone would. She called an ambulance, she tried to resuscitate her, but to no avail. 
and I won't go into any more of the circumstances because they are um, simply too horrifying, but they are uh, touched upon in the Court of Appeal decision. Our client unsurprisingly developed post-traumatic stress disorder as a result of what she had uh, seen and experienced. Once proceedings had been served and the defendant had served their defence, again, the defendant applied for the claim to be struck out or for summary judgment to be given on the basis that, get, that the case didn't satisfy the control mechanisms because there was that separation in time of a few days between the defendant GP's alleged breach of duty and the horrifying event of Evelyn's death. This was before the strikeout in Paul, before the successful appeal in Paul, um, District Judge Lum agreed with the defendant and the claim was struck out. There was a significant delay between the application hearing and handing down of judgment. And during that period, the first instance decision of Master Cook in Paul was given. And by the time the uh, judgment in the purchase case was handed down, the first appeal in Paul was already pending. And in light of that permission to appeal, uh, District Judge Lum's decision was granted. Then when the Paul first appeal succeeded um, and the defendant was given permission to appeal to the Court of Appeal in that case, uh, the case of purchase, our case, was also leapfrogged up to the Court of Appeal to join it. That brings me on to Henry and Ollie's case, the case of Holmere. Um, the claimant's little girl, Esme, had been having some funny turns. She had been seen at the hospital, uh, but they were told that they couldn't find anything wrong. The defendant admits that they should have investigated things further and they would have diagnosed and then treated a serious heart condition, pulmonary veno-occlusive disease. Esme was waiting for a further appointment at the hospital uh, a few months later when she went on a school trip and she had another funny turn. The school called her parents and uh, they came to uh, where Esme was. They came and found her and shortly after that she collapsed and efforts were made to resuscitate her. Her parents tried to help, paramedics came, they tried to save her, but they couldn't. Both parents, uh, devastated uh, by what had happened, developed post-traumatic stress disorder and major depression. Once again, after proceedings were served, the defendant made an application for strikeout or for summary judgment on the basis of that lapse of time of a few months between the breach of duty and Esme's collapse. And the application came before Master Cook a few months after his strikeout in the case of Paul had been overturned by Mr Justice Chamberlain. So on the basis of Mr Justin Chamberlain's decision, he refused to strike out the claim. The defendant's application was dismissed. But the defendant uh, was given permission to appeal that decision, and that appeal was also sent up to the Court of Appeal to join the Paul and the Purchase appeals. So in each of the three cases, importantly, the horrific event which led to the secondary victim injury and claim came some time after the alleged breach of duty by the clinician. In Purchase, it was a few days later. In Palmyre, it was a few months later. In Paul, it was just over a year later. So that's a sharp contrast with the traditional accident claim where the breach of duty, for example, the inattention of a car driver, leads immediately to a horrific accident and a death. Um, and there's also an important difference between many clinical negligence claims and other types of tort claims where, for example, an architect makes a negligent mistake in designing a building and years later it collapses on someone causing a fatality. The difference between that sort of claim and many clinical negligence claims is that in the architect's case, there's no loss, there's no injury to the primary victim until the horrific building collapse. Whereas in many clinical negligence cases, from the point of the doctor's mistake, the breach of duty, the primary victim may be suffering ongoing effects from that breach, internal biological processes or continuing symptoms, which would have stopped if the doctor had done their job properly. And that could be going on for days, weeks, months, or even years before a final horrific event. So these are the differences which were the subject of much discussion in the Court of Appeal hearing and the key features um, that were discussed in the Court of Appeal hearing, on which you're going to hear from Dave. Thanks, Ollie. Thank you very much, Esther. Um, Dave, can we bring you in now then, please, to talk about the Court of Appeal's decision and their reasoning? Oh, well, thanks, Ollie, and thanks, Esther, and, and thanks, Henry. 
Um, as we all know, the effect of the decision of the Court of Appeal thus far uh, has been that the defendant's appeal in Paul was allowed, the claimant's appeal in Polmere and Purchase were each dismissed, uh, with the result that all three uh, claims were struck out. Um, and it's a particularly strong Court of Appeal panel. We had uh, Sir Geoffrey Voss, Master of the Rolls, uh, Lord Justice Underhill, uh, President of the Civil Division of the uh, Court of Appeal, uh, and Lady Justice Davis, who, uh, while she was at the bar, uh, was a very renowned and uh, vastly experienced uh, clinical negligence practitioner. Um, Sir Geoffrey Voss gave the main judgment. Um, Lord Justice Underhill gave a, a shorter judgment. They both agreed with each other. Uh, and Lady Justice Davis um, agreed with both of them uh, with the results that I've uh, explained. Uh, however, and perhaps unusually, the Court of Appeal did suggest that uh, we might like to apply for permission to uh, appeal to the Supreme Court, which uh, all parties did, uh, and it was duly granted. Uh, now, when considering the appeals, the, the Court of Appeal were obviously mindful of the words of Lord Stain in uh, White against Chief Constable of South Yorkshire, uh, thus far and no further, uh, by which Lord Stain meant uh, that the existing control mechanisms uh, which applied uh, or, or were given rise to in the case of Alcock should uh, not be expanded to allow uh, recovery of any greater categories of, of, of uh, claimants than had uh, hitherto been the case. Uh, however, um, as later uh, cases made clear, and the Court of Appeal were referred to this, that didn't mean that the courts could not consider whether novel factual situations could give rise to recovery of secondary victims within the existing uh, control factors. Um, and as, or control mechanisms, I should say, uh, and as Esther has pointed out, there were some quite novel features about these three uh, appeals. Uh, and what the Court of Appeal was grappling with was uh, whether the claimants could recover within the existing uh, control mechanisms. Uh, and the uh, existing, the, the, the odd features or unusual features about these three uh, appeals were that there were clinical negligence cases in which, uh, as Esther has said, there was a lapse of time between the initial breach of duty and the final horrific event to which that breach of duty uh, gave rise. Um, all of the deceased, uh, sadly, experienced some form of uh, biological process between the breach of duty and their uh, death, uh, which uh, had been caused by the breach of duty and which led to their death. Um, I, I use the term biological process in, in its most neutral sense because um, a, a lot of um, uh, discussion in the Court of Appeal was around what sort of damage the uh, primary victims had suffered and whether that in itself prevented uh, recovery on the part of the uh, secondary victims. So uh, Mr Paul had undiagnosed heart disease, which uh, ultimately led to his uh, collapse. Uh, Evelyn um, uh, Purchase had untreated pneumonia uh, and Esme uh, Polmer had an untreated cardiac condition which led to uh, some blackouts. Um, now uh, during the uh, argument by the court in the Court of Appeal, the, the Court of Appeal remarked more than once that the established cases uh, did not real, really deal with these uh, situations. Um, however, extensive reference was made to Taylor and Somerset 1993 High Court and Taylor and Novo 2013 uh, Court of Appeal. And the facts of Taylor and Somerset 1993 were that the uh, claimant's uh, husband died of a heart attack as a result of a negligent failure to diagnose a uh, cardiac condition. Claimant was told about the death uh, within an hour of the death occurring at hospital and saw the body in the morgue. Um, and she suffered psychiatric uh, fallout as a result. Uh, but according to, or as Lord Just, as, as Mr Justice Old found, was not entitled to recover because he said that, uh, amongst other things, the, the death was the culmination of a natural process of heart disease and that the death 
uh, however shocking, when the claimant heard of it, could not give could could not form part of the immediate aftermath uh, exception, uh, and that case was referred to at some length in the case of uh, Taylor and Novo, which was also discussed at some length in the Court of Appeal. Uh, and as Henry has pointed out, the facts of that were that um, a claimant's mum uh, was injured, uh, uh, apparently not significantly, in an accident at work uh, when an employee uh, caused some uh, racking boards to fall on her. Three weeks later, uh, and this was witnessed by the claimant, um, claimant's mum collapsed and died from a DVT, which led to a pulmonary embolism, and that was caused by the um, initial breach of duty. Uh, and Lord Justice Dyson, who was then the master of the roles uh, in Taylor and Novo, held that she could not uh, recover. Uh, now I say, and, and this met with some sympathy in the Court of Appeal, that the ratio of Taylor and Novo is, is quite difficult to identify. Um, but part of the reasoning of Lord Justice, um, uh, forgive me, uh, Lord Dyson, um, was was clearly that um, he was concerned at the lapse of time between the initial accident involving uh, Mrs. Taylor's mum uh, and her final death three weeks later. And, and he said that that would stretch the concept of proximity, in other words, recoverability, uh, too far, uh, and the claim was dismissed. So those were the two uh, main authorities discussed in the uh, Court of Appeal. Uh, and against that background, the counsel for the defendants argued that all three claims should fail because in all three claims, the uh, deceased, uh, who were the primary victims, had suffered what, what was termed actionable damage before the horrific event. And it was said that so long as the uh, secondary victim witnesses a horrific event up to and including the time that first actionable damage occurs in the primary victim, they can recover. But if the horrific event occurs after uh, actionable damage has occurred, uh, they can't recover. And by actionable damage, uh, counsel for the defendants said that they meant damage which would entitle the primary victim to sue for negligence in his or her own right. And applied to the facts of Paul, for example, they said that Mr. Paul would have been able to recover as a as a claimant in his own right before the horrific event because he had also already suffered actionable damage, which was the ongoing process of heart disease. And they said that actionable damage matters uh, uh, occurs whether or not the secondary victim witnesses it. So uh, they argued that in Mr. Paul's case, the claim by the secondary victim was barred because the secondary victim witnessed the uh, horrific event after Mr. Paul had already suffered actionable damage, and it mattered not that that actionable damage by uh, it, it within Mr. Paul was incapable of detection. It was, as it were, latent uh, hidden damage. Uh, now, counsel for the uh, claimants in Paul argued a different test, which was more generous to uh, claimants as a whole. Uh, and they said that the control mechanism was uh, that the uh, secondary victim could recover so long as they witnessed the horrific event up to and including the time that the primary victim suffers uh, manifest damage. Um, and manifest damage was defined as uh, damage that it was the duty of the defendant to protect the primary victim against uh, when the damage first becomes manifest uh, or evident. And it was argued on behalf of Paul that in the Paul case, uh, Mr. Paul had not yet suffered manifest damage, in other words, damage which uh, could be discerned by people outside Mr. Paul. Uh, and therefore, uh, at the time of the horrific event, it wasn't too late for the um, uh, claimants to recover as secondary victims. But it will be noted that both those tests postulated did introduce the concept of damage within the primary victim as a potential control mechanism. Uh, and Esther and I for Purchase and uh, Henry and Ollie for Polmere argued that damage to the primary victim, whether manifest or actionable or, or in fact any damage at all, was irrelevant as a control mechanism and, and couldn't prevent the secondary victims uh, from uh, recovering. 
we argued that so long as the secondary victim witnessed a horrific event involving the primary victim and otherwise fell within the uh, control mechanism set out in Alcock, uh, then we could recover and, and so could any claimant. Uh, and we said that a lapse of time between the breach of duty and the horrific event again was irrelevant as long as the other control mechanisms were satisfied. Um, and, and I, on behalf of Purchase, said that the ratio of Taylor and Novo, if anything, was that if there's already been one horrific event, uh, the secondary victim cannot recover if there is a second uh, horrific event. And I said in, in that case, it's clear that the first horrific event was the first accident involving mum, and the second one uh, was the death uh, in which uh, mum died. Um, now, the Court of Appeal, in considering all those arguments, found that uh, the uh, uh, laws of secondary victims applied to clinic cases as they did to uh, PI cases. Um, they dismissed all the arguments advanced by all the claimants um, and indeed the defendants. And, and, and in the first instance, they said that um, any control re mechanism by reference to prior damage to the primary victim, uh, whether uh, manifest or actionable, could not be a control mechanism. And, and Sir Geoffrey Voss said that that would give rise as a control mechanism to complex factual disputes. Uh, there was nothing in the authorities to uh, support it. And, and as he put it, it would be illogical to drill down into the legal liability and damage to the primary victim when discerning or working out whether the secondary victim has got a claim. And he said that was particularly the case uh, when in Alcott, Lord Oliver said in some circumstances, uh, there can be recovery by the secondary victim through witnessing a, hor a horrific event even if the primary victim hasn't suffered any damage. And Lord Justice Underhill said that the uh, damage test would be um, unworkable. They then had to consider whether they agreed with our arguments that um, the claimants in this case, in these cases could recover because the time lapse between breach of duty and um, uh, the horrific event was uh, irrelevant. Um, they appeared to uh, be open to that argument. Um, Sir Geoffrey Voss suggested that without looking at the authorities, uh, the fact of a lapse of time between breach and horrific events should not be a bar to recovery. He said applying the five control mechanisms in Alcock, time lapse uh, should not be a problem. Uh, and he said, and I quote, uh, the question then is whether the authorities that I have summarised above prevent us reaching that conclusion which is that broadly advanced by the Palmyre and purchased uh, claimants. And Lord Justice Underhill said um, that the essential feature of all these cases was that there was a gap in time between breach of duty and shocking event. Uh, and he said um, it follows, and I quote, uh, that if the point were free from authority, I would be minded to hold that on the pleaded facts, the claimants in all three cases should be entitled to recover. I do not think that recognising the necessary proximity in such cases would be contrary to the thus far and no further approach taken in White. It would not involve going beyond the elements established in Alcock. Rather, it would represent their application in a different factual situation. So what Lord Justice Underhill was saying there is that um, looking at the control mechanisms in Alcock, firstly, uh, a gap in time between breach and hor horrific event should not be a bar to recovery. And secondly, it wouldn't be extending the class of people entitled to recover, which uh, Lord Stain in, in the case of White uh, warned against. Uh, however, and it's a big however, uh, the claims were dismissed because the Court of Appeal ultimately felt that they were bound by the ratio of what they regarded to be the ratio of Taylor and Novo, uh, which was influenced by the case of Taylor and Somerset. And um, uh, Sir Geoffrey Voss said uh, as follows, and I quote, Novo is binding authority for the proposition that no claim can be brought in respect to psychiatric injury caused by a separate horrific event removed in time from the original negligence, accident, or a first uh, horrific event. And Lord Justice Underhill said a similar thing. And what that means is that if the law 
as it stands as applied by the Court of Appeal remains, then there will be very few claims for clinical negligence secondary victims because they, they're saying that where there is a gap in time between breach of duty and the horrific event, there can be no recovery based on uh, Taylor and Novo. And if you think about it, that would put an end to most ClinNet claims because, as I said, there's usually a gap between the doctor's breach of duty and the final horrific event because it takes time for the unpaid, untreated or the, the injured uh, patient uh, to suffer the horrific event. Uh, however, uh, the uh, Court of Appeal did express reservations as to whether Taylor and Novo was correctly decided, uh, and they they suggested that the parties might apply for permission to appeal. And Sir Geoffrey Voss said, I accept, and I quote, that the actual decision in Walters does not sit easily with Somerset and Novo. I think we are bound by Novo. And he went on to say, and I quote, I have, as I have already said, reservations about whether Novo correctly interprets the limitations on liability to secondary victims contained in the five elements emerging from the House of Lords authorities. Subject to hearing further argument, therefore, I would be prepared to grant permission to the claimants to appeal to the Supreme Court, if sought, so that it, I, so that it can consider the important issues that arise uh, in this case. And Lord Justice Underhill said it was hard to find a principled reason why there should be no proximity, in other words, no recovery, where there was some lapse of time between breach and horrific event. He said, I've not found it easy to identify the precise na na ratio of Taylor and Novo. And my strong provisional view is that the issues raised by them uh, merit consideration by the Supreme Court. So overall, the Court of Appeal felt bound by what they regarded to be the ratio of uh, Taylor and Novo to dismiss all the uh, claims, but they uh, suggested that the law was ripe for review by the Supreme Court and we have accordingly got uh, permission. Uh, as to what happens next, I leave it to others to explain. Uh, Ollie. Thanks very much, Dave. Um, Esther, then could we come to you, please? And can you discuss for us uh, the possible outcomes in the Supreme Court, and indeed the potential implications stemming from that. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Ollie. Um, so as Dave's explained, in essence, the Court of Appeal said that these three claims satisfy the control mechanisms as set out by the House of Lords in Olcock, but they couldn't get around the Court of Appeal decision in Novo. The Supreme Court can cut through all of the noise. They are not bound by any previous Court of Appeal decision. They're not bound by NOVO. Um, the court, previous Court of Appeal decisions will no doubt provide some interesting discussion points for the Supreme Court, but not necessarily more than that. We would expect them to predominantly look at Olcock and McLaughlin and use those to decide whether these claims ought to succeed. In terms of the uh, range of decisions, there's uh, three uh, probably most obvious outcomes. Um, the first is that we could lose. Uh, the Supreme Court could differ from the Court of Appeal. They could feel that Novo was the right decision and uphold it um, and accept that its interpretation is as wide as the Court of Appeal said and therefore conclude that these claims must fail. And as Dave has just alluded to, in practical terms, that would mean that most clinical negligence secondary victim claims would be doomed to fail because almost always there's a lapse of time between a doctor's breach of duty and a significant impact on a primary victim. It's pretty rare for a doctor to do something and for it to immediately cause something catastrophic and horrifying. And it's even more rare for that to happen in front of a family member rather than, for example, in theatre. One possible scenario um, where a claim could potentially succeed could be where a midwife or a doctor makes a terrible mistake during a woman's labour and the partner is there for the birth and witnesses the horrifying consequences of that mistake. But it's really very difficult to think of other clinical situations which could result in a successful secondary victim claim if the Supreme Court um, upholds the interpretation of Novo that the Court of Appeal applied 
um, and declined to overrule it. It would also mean that more secondary victim claims arising out of other torts would fail. For example, where there's a breach in planning or training or maintenance or construction, which causes an accident days or weeks or months or years later. What we think, however, is more likely is the second or third um, potential uh, obvious outcomes. Um, we hope and anticipate that with them predominantly going back to basics, back to those control mechanisms set out in McLaughlin and Alcock, the Supreme Court would reach the same conclusion as the Lord and Lady Justices of Appeal, that the facts of these claims do satisfy those control mechanisms. And further, consider that there's no reason to add to the control mechanisms, which is effectively what the Court of Appeal said Novo did. If the Supreme Court has reservations about the correctness of the decision in Novo, as the Master of the Rolls did, they can conclude that it was wrong and they can simply overturn it. The Court of Appeal, of course, can only overrule a previous decision by itself if particular criteria are met, which in this case, the Court of Appeal found they were not whereas the Supreme Court uh, has the liberty to do as they please. Alternatively, uh, outcome three, uh, they could place a narrower interpretation on NOVO than that which the Court of Appeal uh, adopted. The interpretation that the Court of Appeal adopted is arguably wider than that that even the defendants proposed at the Court of Appeal hearing. The defendants, as Dave has said, argued that uh, Novo meant that the horrific event has to coincide with the completion of the tort or the moment when the primary victim first suffers actionable damage. Whereas the Court of Appeal said that the uh, decision in Novo meant that the horrific event has to coincide with the breach of duty. And as I've already alluded to, that, that results in most clinical negligence secondary victim cases failing and plenty of other secondary victim claims at failing. Arguably, it's difficult to justify that very wide interpretation when one looks at all of the case law. Even in Olcock and in Novo, there was no discussion of when the breach of duty occurred or even exactly what it was, and no discussion of whether that breach of duty coincided with or preceded the injuries to the primary victim. So there are good reasons why the Supreme Court could decide that Novo was correct on its facts, but that its ratio is not as wide as the Court of Appeal found it to be. And with that outcome, there's a very good chance that these three claims would pass that additional Novo test, as well as satisfying the Olcott control mechanisms and then again, the appeals would succeed. So in summary, with the Supreme Court not being bound by Novo and the parties having the opportunity to make detailed submissions on the very wide interpretation of Novo that the Court of Appeal adopted, um, we would anticipate that the Supreme Court would either overrule Novo or adopt a much narrower interpretation of it. And either way found that the control mechanisms are satisfied in these cases and the appeals would succeed. And that would have the effect of putting uh, secondary victim claims really on a much more equal footing with secondary victims of other torts, still very much constrained by the five control mechanisms, still having to meet those very stringent tests, but with some realistic chance of satisfying those tests, rather than being enormously limited by a further restriction that the breach of duty has to immediately cause a horrific event. Whatever happens, of course, the decision of the Supreme Court will take our clients a step closer to closure. It's obviously extremely difficult having this litigation arising out of the horrifying death of a loved one hanging over them for years now. And similarly for the clinicians involved, uh, no one would want to overlook the distress um, that these situations cause to clinicians implicated in a death. And as well as providing closure to, closure to those involved in these cases, the Supreme Court decision, whichever way it goes, will provide much needed clarity to lawyers and litigants who have spent years not being able to advise their clients with real certainty in relation to these types of claims. Thanks, Ollie. Thank you very much, Esther. Uh, we do still have 
a few minutes left and we have a couple of questions. Um, the first of which actually, Esther, I'm going to ask to you. Um, and the question reads, I have two secondary victim claims for parents. The facts are identical to purchase an Ahmed. Uh, the mum unfortunately committed suicide two and a half years after the shocking event. How do you suggest I address proving what the mum saw was shocking in witness evidence uh, of other relatives, as we have no witness statement from the mum? What, what an awful set of circumstances. Um, so the things that I would suggest are thought about are, first of all, did anyone else witness what had happened who can provide a witness statement? Um, so in the purchase case, the uh, father and younger daughter were present as well, and it may well be that in this other case, other family members were there and they can say what they witnessed. Um, alternatively, if the, um, the sadly bereaved uh, parent um, provided an account, if she described or she or he described to anyone else um, what happened, whether they can provide a hearsay account, Obviously, in civil proceedings, hearsay is admissible. So whilst it's not the strongest of evidence, it still can help to build a picture. Um, I wonder whether they had uh, provided an account of what happened and described what happened to either a treating uh, psychiatrist or psychologist or to a medico legal expert instructed in the claim. And if so, then there is, again, a hearsay account, but still uh, a potentially very reliable account of what they witnessed and how horrifying it was for them. Um, and lastly, depending on the medical condition um, and the circumstances of the, the tragic death uh, of the child, um, it could be that a medical expert, an appropriate medical expert, could provide an opinion as to how that death is likely to have manifested. And that could provide um, some further evidence to show that what was witnessed would have been horrifying. So I think there's a, a variety of routes to investigate there and hopefully scope to uh, pull together the necessary evidence. Thank you, Esther. Um, David, I'm going to come to you next. Uh, could you please give some sort of big picture general advice on uh, what to do where an ongoing case has similar facts to those that are currently being appealed uh, in, in these appeals, uh, where there's a delayed manifestation of injury, at least a secondary victim claim? I think you simply apply to stay the claim, pending the outcome of um, the Supreme Court appeals in in this case. As far as I'm aware, the uh, other claims uh, uh, were stayed uh, pending the appeal in uh, Purchase Palmer and and, and um, uh, Paul in the Court of Appeal. So the same would be done uh, for the Supreme Court. Um, as for confirmation as to what stage the appeals are at between the Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court, that should either be a matter of public record or the defendants uh, should be able to let you know in general terms. Um, but the short answer is that you, you apply for a stay. Thank you. Um, Henry, I'll come to you with a question now, if I may. Um, if I'm running a personal injury claim with a particularly nasty accident, how can I best determine whether an onlooker has a runnable secondary victim claim? And should the claims, I'm assuming primary and, and secondary victim claims, be run together or run separately? Thanks, Ollie. I think just, just before I answer that, answer that if I may, um, just to add my own two pen, I think picking up on what, what Dave and Esther have said, I think it's worth highlighting to people that uh, it's rare, my understanding is it's rare for the Court of Appeal to give permission to appeal to the Supreme Court. Um, and it's perhaps even rarer for their judgments, almost on our reading at least, to encourage uh, uh, an application for permission uh, to appeal. And on one reading of their judgments, although the claimants were unsuccessful, um, it was arguably not, not the result that the Court of Appeal would otherwise wanted to have come to. Um, I mean, that's that's my, my reading of things. So I have, although I'm sometimes perhaps accused of being unduly optimistic generally, um, I, I, I'm cautiously optimistic about the prospects of going to the Supreme Court. And I, and I certainly think that those on the claimant side uh, of this sort of work shouldn't feel too demoralised, albeit we've got a bit more work to do. Um, to answer the question about, about the onlooker, I mean, obviously the, the word onlooker be begs questions as to whether or not there was a close tie of love and affection between the secondary victim and the primary victim. 
if there wasn't, you know, we of course would want to ask questions about whether in fact this onlooker themselves was imperiled by what took place. Is there any some other relationship between the defendant and the claimant, such as employment, that might found on the basis for uh, a duty of care? Does it come within the rescuer cases, that the scope of rescuer cases being outside today's talk? But anyway, I think really back to first principles, what you need are very clear witness statements um, describing what happened, but also most importantly, what was observed by that particular individual. And when it comes to the secondary victim, their, if you like, non-expert explanation as to what impact it had on them, which should be the basis for the, the expert evidence. As to whether to run the cases separately or together, I think it depends what is in issue. Now, if there are no argument about breach of duty, so in personal injury case, let's assume the, 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 the driver on the defendant's side admits negligence for causing the accident, then there's probably not actually much overlap. And I don't think there's necessarily going to need to run those cases together because the primary victim, the secondary victim, um, suffer completely distinct injuries, which will require distinct and separate quantification. And I can't see much merit in them being run together. So it's only really if there's a common issue that the court needs to determine that I would think you want to get them, at least for that preliminary issue, to be to be listed together. Thank you, Henry. Uh, we're just running up against the end of time. Um, very briefly, I think the first question of those questions that have has been a little flurry towards the end. Um, the final question I, I'm going to ask again, perhaps to, to David, any ideas of time scale for a Supreme Court judgment? My assumption would be no, but I, I'll ask you as well, of course. Uh, no is the answer. Um, it won't be in the next few months. Thank you. Sorry, um, I can't be more helpful than that. No, of course. Um, well, to be clear, a few more questions have come in, and I'll just reiterate, um, if you'd still like us to consider them, please do email them in, uh, and we'll do our best to get back to you. Um, but we have we have run up against the, the deadline, as it were, at the end of the, the uh, webinar. Um, so thanks very much to all the attendees who've attended. Um, we're, we're delighted to have seen so many of you come along and thank you for such um, pertinent and insightful questions uh, and thank you of course also to Henry, Esther and David uh, for giving up their time uh, to answer those questions and to talk about it more generally. And thank you Ollie for sharing. My pleasure. Thanks. Thanks all. <laughs>